It's the essence of Christianity is just being. Not becoming, being. That is the essence of the new creation. Just be like Him in all things. Well, I'm going to start off with some questions uh, before we jump back in here and do some things. I do want to answer these questions. Guys, keep your questions coming. I love the, love the questions. We want to get these answered and help you out. So, um, let me pull something up on my phone real quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, so this question says, could you explain yesterday's statement about not needing to take communion? Good, good question. So, uh, I want to make sure we're clear on that. I'm not saying you, you don't have to or need to. I mean, you can. Um, when I say you don't need to take communion, uh, I'm talking about a spiritually mature Christian. So, uh, I'll run through these really quick and I'll give you the Reader's Digest version on the four types of people and the four ways to get healed or healing for everyone. If you want the longer version, there's a great uh, little book over there called Healing for Everyone. It breaks down four people group, uh, four people groups. And the first person, people group is unbelievers. Uh, we would say, well, how do unbelievers get healed? Well, unbelievers get healed by the laying on of hands. Um, so it's Mark 16, 18. Believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Okay, So that's how unbelievers get healed. And actually, if you go back and read that, Jesus was talking to his believers and he said that they would go out and do these things. And the, watch, and if they preach the gospel and they believe, they would be saved. If they didn't, they would be damned. He says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Right? He, now, now watch this. The, the, the disciples were already laying hands on the sick. They were already casting out devils. They were already doing that stuff. So he was actually showing them the ones that you go out and get saved, even these signs would follow those ones. So that even gets rid of the idea that healing passed away with the original 12. Right? And, and the other, you know, I know it's also not true that it's passed away with the original 12, because there's some churches that teach you that, is that, uh, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29 says that, and God has placed in the church, uh, firstly, apostles, some prophets. So for people that say, oh, there's no more apostles, well then, if there's no more apostles, then there must be no more church. Because God hath set in the church apostles, prophets, you know, and then he goes on to uh, uh, tongues and and miracles, and healings, and, and administrations, and all these things that God had set in the church. So if God set these things in the church, and healings is one of them, then that means that the, if the church is still here today, can we agree the church is still here today? Are we still in the church age? Okay, just making sure. Then healing is for today. Amen? And so now Jesus was telling His disciples, if you go out and you lay your hands on the sick, those unbelievers that you lay your hands on, they're going to get healed. Remember, uh, I think it was yesterday, I said in one of the sessions, that it's the goodness of God that leads men to what? Repentance. Repentance, right? That God, watch, the Bible also says it rains on the just and the unjust. Most people look at that scripture and think that's a bad thing. When they go through a hard time, they go, well, you know, it rains on the just and the unjust. No, see, rain in the Bible is actually considered a blessing. You wanted rain. Rain brought forth crops and fruit and harvest. The rain was good. You needed the early and the latter rain. So when the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust, what it's saying is I'm good to the unjust and I'm good to the just. Why? Because it's the goodness of my, it's my goodness that leads men to repentance. So that's the first type of group. And the second group would be baby Christians. Baby Christians get healed by James chapter 5, where he says in James chapter 5, is there any sick among you? Call for the elders and have them anoint you with oil. Let them pray the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now, interesting, why do you say that's for baby Christians? Because James was the first book written in the New Testament. Believe it or not, it wasn't Matthew. <laughs> Even though Matthew is the first one in your, your New Testament, James, chronologically, was the first book written in the New Testament. It was the first letter to the church, right? Now, it was let, written to the church of Jerusalem, but this thing had just gotten started. I mean, there was a lot of baby Christians, a lot of new people being added to the church. And so James, now, when you get someone born again, at least in most churches that I've, I've experienced, when they get somebody born again at a service, what's the first book they usually tell them to read? John. That shouldn't be John. It should be James. James should be the first book a new believer reads. Why? Because James literally goes through every part of a new believer's life. He talks about words. He talks about faith. He talks about wisdom. He talks about how to treat others. He talks about what true religion looks like, what true faith looks like. He, he talks about, you know, what do you do if you get sick? 
What do you do if you've got a problem with your brother? He gives us the basic instructions within a church. So James is the best book for a brand new believer. So in that book that was addressed to brand new believers, he says, if there's any sick among you, meaning that you know, I know there's new believers being added to the church, so if there is any sick among you, have them call for the elders. Well, right there, I also know that's being written to the, written to the baby Christians, because what are they doing? They're calling for the mature ones, the elders. This also shows us that elders must know how to get people healed. If you're in a church that has elders and the elders don't know how to get people healed, they're not elders. Because if you call upon them and you need healed and they can't get it done, they shouldn't be an elder. Here's what the prayer of faith is not. O oh Lord, if it be thy will. That is not the prayer of faith. Okay? The prayer of faith is right now in Jesus' name. I command all sickness and disease to leave your body now in the name of Jesus. That's the prayer of faith. Why? Because faith speaks what it wants. Faith, watch this church, faith will always get what it came for. Faith doesn't question. Faith doesn't, well, I wonder what God's going to do. We're going to put it in His court and see what He wants to do. No, He's told us what He wants us to do. He's clearly told us His will. So I don't have to question, is this God's will? See, if you want to know God's will... Read God's Word. You want to do His will? Do the Word. It's that simple. People don't know God's will because they don't read God's Word. If they would read God's Word, they would know that it's never God's will for any person to remain sick. And so elders were ones that got the new baby Christians healed. The next category of persons uh, or people uh, would be carnal Christians. This is the kind of relating to the question that this person was asking. This is why I was saying, you know, you don't, you know, as a mature Christian, you don't need to take communion. But carnal Christians, which, yes, is a category of its own. There's, a carnal Christian could still be a baby Christian, but they also could be a little more mature than just a baby Christian. Honestly, I've met some Christians that have been born again for a year that were more mature than people that have been born again for 40 years. I'm serious. So when we hear the word elder in the Bible, it has nothing to do with age. It has to do with maturity. It has to do with where your, walk, where your walk is with the Lord, right? And so he says, you know, about carnal Christians. Now, carnal Christians get healed through communion. Now, they could call for the elders, and they could have them anointed with oil, because, again, a baby Christian is still carnal. But if, why? Why the oil? Because, you know, I actually had somebody recently text me... Um, we were on our way to do service in Gettysburg at church on Sunday morning. This person texted me and said, hey, I'm going to be in service today. Um, I've been dealing with this issue, uh, this pain. You know, it's, it's just been unrelenting this week. And Can you anoint me with oil and, and, and take care of this? And I said, sure. And so we got to church, and we were setting things up. And, and I was like, oh, I was like, that person texted me. I was like, ah, I don't have any oil on me. I was like, that's all right. I don't need oil, right? And then she came to me, and then when she got there, she saw me, and she came up to me, and she goes, you know, I'm here. She goes, I said, well, I said, I'm sorry, I, said, I don't have any oil. And she's like, oh, she says, that's okay. She goes, well, do you need oil? And I said, no, I don't need oil. I said, you're the one that requested oil. I said, I didn't request oil. I said, do you need oil? She's like, no, I don't need oil. I just figured you needed oil. And I'm like, no, no. I was like, I don't need any oil. So I just laid my hands on her, set her free that instant. Actually, she texted me later that afternoon and said all the pain was completely gone. Um, yeah, so I mean, but I don't need oil. Now, the, the baby Christian might need oil because, again, the oil is fragrant. It's, it's pleasing to the senses. You can feel it, right? It's kind of greasy. It leaves that mark there. You can also feel the person applying their hands to you with the oil. It's all sensual, right? It's carnal, right? Because a baby Christian is still carnal. They're, a baby Christian is still living by their feelings, their emotions, the, the surroundings. That, that really help, you know, it helps them to understand, okay, I smell the oil. I feel the oil. Okay, this is helping my faith. It helps their faith, right? And a carnal Christian, Paul gives us, and we know that communion is good for carnal Christians because Paul was writing in the Corinthians the instructions for communion, and he was writing to the most carnal church. I mean, they were the most carnal church. I think I shared with you that they were eating all the bread and drinking all the wine and getting drunk. So it was just turning into a big party. And so he had to come in. That's why he had to correct it. That's why, you know, people look at Corinthians. And I said this yesterday, Corinthians is the church corrected while Ephesians is the church perfected. People will look at the book of Corinthians and they'll be like, oh, this is so good. Like we need to like, OK, yeah, I understand what Corinthians is saying. It's good. There's good stuff in there. But Paul was correcting a lot of messed up stuff in there. Like it's he was I mean, he was correcting an issue where there was a there was a man in there sleeping with his father in law's wife. I mean, it was like really some messed up stuff that he was dealing with with the, with the Corinthian church. 
And so he's giving them clear-cut instructions on communion, and we know that he was giving these instructions on, on communion, and that it is the meal that heals, because he says, if you don't do communion right, this is the reason many sleep, or sorry, many are weak, many are sick, and many sleep, meaning die prematurely. So we know that communion not only can get you healed, but it can keep you healed, right? And it was written to the most carnal church. So he was showing a carnal group of believers, this is how you get healed and stay healed. Now, beyond that, that's why I said you don't technically need to take communion, because beyond that, if you're a mature believer, if you're an elder, like if this would be at this point, you probably would be an elder, but you're a spiritually mature believer, you understand, I don't need anybody to lay hands on me. You know, I can lay hands on myself if I need to, but I don't need to do that even, right? I don't need oil. I don't need, you know, elders, because more than likely I probably am an elder in the church. I don't need to do communion. I could. Please understand what I'm saying. I could do communion. As an elder, I could grab my, I could grab my bread, I could grab my juice, I could sit down and receive my healing. Why? Because Jesus paid for it. I could absolutely do that. I don't even need to do that, though. I realize, Romans 8 and 11, that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. And if He dwells in me, will He not quicken my mortal body? The word quicken in the Greek literally means to bring alive. Right? Now, he's bringing, alive this, he's bringing alive my mortal body. The Spirit of God that's in me quickens, heals, delivers, whatever I need. If there's something wrong in my body, I just release the Spirit of God to that part of my body, and he fixes it. Amen? Which we'll, we'll kind of get into this when we get into spirit, soul, and body, and I'll show you uh, what the Spirit does to the body and how that all works. So hopefully that helps answer that question for whoever asked that. Um, what is the Scripture where God connected Job... Uh, the Lord giveth and taketh away, or sorry, God corrected, sorry, God corrected Job. Uh, that begins in Job verse, 38. no, I'm sorry, chapter, th- chapter 38. Job chapter 38, God begins to sit Job down and say, and basically says, um, what, what did he say, how did he say that? I forget how he exactly said it, but he was like, you know, who is this that uh, darkens my words with this counsel? In other words, you, you're, you're, you're taking my words out of context. You're taking what I've said and you're, you're actually speaking falsely against me. Uh, it starts in Job 38, and it probably even runs down to even Job 41. Um, do you know, if you, t- okay, the other day, well, I'll just back up. I'll tell you a little story real quick. Because Job spoke falsely against God, right? He actually he accused God that God did this and, and God didn't do that. It was, it was a couple months ago, maybe a month or two ago, I just kind of had this moment with the Lord. I was brushing my teeth in the bathroom, and I was hearing my daughter and my wife having a conversation out in the living room, and they were talking. She was quizzing Leo on the Ten Commandments, like in order and having her go through them and this and that. And so I'm listening, and she got to the one, you know, not, she forgot one, and I think it was this one. She forgot one, and she's like, oh, what's the last one I'm forgetting? And it was, do not take the Lord's name in vain, right? And, then, and she, well, what's that mean, Mommy? And she says, well, that's like saying, you know, like, you know, using the Lord's name improperly, like, oh, my God. And like saying, you know, well, people like you use GD. They use that word, right? Uh, I'll tell you a little side story off of this. I, when I used to work my secular job, I had a boss that constantly GD this, GD that, GD that. Finally, I said, his name was Mark. I said, Mark. He looked up at me, and he was my boss. And he said, how would you like it if every time I messed up, I cursed your dad's name? And he looked at me like this, and he goes, Shane, I am so sorry. And it was the last time he ever did that around me. See, that's that, we need to take authority over those things. And, you know, it set that thing straight. You know, it, it, it's not okay to curse God's name. And it's not okay to include his name in curse words. But here's the thing that's neat about this. I started doing a study on taking the Lord's, the Lord's name in vain. And it goes further than just, you know, GD this or oh my God that or whatever. It goes way further than that. When you take the Lord's name in vain, and not only is, does it include those things, but it actually means that you're speaking falsely against him, a false accusation against his name, because he says, I've elevated my word above his name, right? And so now you're speaking against his name, and you're accusing, of, accusing him of something you've never, he's never done, or you're, you're, you're bearing false witness against him and speaking falsely against him. You're actually taking his name in vain. So when you say things about God that aren't true, like Job, you're taking the Lord's name in vain, because that's not who he is. You, you hear that, right? He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's, he's, we've given him all these names, but we cannot take those in vain. If he's Jehovah Rapha, he's the Lord that healeth me, then he is my healer. 
then I can't speak falsely against healing because I'm actually taking that name in vain. If I say, well, I understand healing's in the Bible, but I'm not sure about it, I'm not sure if it's for me, I'm taking his name in vain because that's who he is. That's the very essence of who he is. So if he's my healer, then I am healed. See what I'm saying? So we got to be careful how we speak about God, the things we talk about. We must talk about him the way he is and, and the way he's meant to be talked about, not falsely. So, uh, but that starts in Job 38. Let's see here. Could you explain 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18 through 19? Um, now, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know who 1 Peter, well, let me actually just, well, I, could, I have it in my weast here. I'll, well, let me do this. Let me back up. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. This is uh, uh, another thing that you know, people, well, what does this mean? And it, it can be used out of context. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a verse very easy to be used out of context. I'll just put it that way. Um, one of the reasons that we have so much Scripture being used out of context is because we have preachers and teachers who do topical preaching rather than contextual preaching. We, we have preachers who want to, well, my topic today is, you know, I don't just trying to think, patience or whatever. I don't know, we'll just pick a topic, right? That's my topic. And then they'll go into the Bible and they'll try to find all these Scriptures that match patience or at least fit their agenda for patience, right? Without, and what can happen is, is when you go in and cherry pick certain scriptures that you think have to do with patience, you can end up taking those scriptures out of context because you pulled it out of their context. The problem is most people, and what you need to do, you can't just cherry pick scriptures and go, I'm just going to read this scripture. You better read before it and after it because these were letters that were written to us. These weren't one-liners that were written to us. You know, people say, well, which part of Ephesians should I start in? The first part, all the way to the end part. It's one letter. Chapter and verse breakups were never there. And so you need to read the whole letter to get the context of what he's trying to tell us in that letter, right? Because if you don't, and you just take one spot in the middle of the letter, you might be left going, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Well, if you read before and after, you'll know what that means, right? Now, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says, and if they... Sorry, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God, commit, sorry, let them suffer, let, sorry, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto faith, to a faithful Creator. Now, the person asked, you know, the people usually use this, use this in context of knowing, not knowing whether they are going to go to heaven or not. Because what does he say here in verse 18? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, I started pulling this scripture up and started dig, doing a little bit of digging. And it didn't take me long to figure out what he was actually trying to say. Uh, so I actually went into the Weast, uh, the Weast Word Studies, which I, we don't have Weast Word Studies. We have his translations, but his weird Word Studies were amazing. And Weast actually kind of breaks this idea of scarcely. We think of scarcely saved. If they're scarcely saved, that means just once in a while they're saved. Like it's not very often they're saved. But the word scarcely is actually not a proper translation there. Um, that's one of the things with translations. People get so hung up on one translation. You know, I've heard people say, man, it's King Jimmy and King Jimmy only. I ain't doing nothing else. So it's like, okay, well, just hold on a second. You know, I understand I love King James. I actually do New King James for my, myself. I, I read manuals are in King James. You know, but I also like looking at the ESV. I also like looking at the MB, MEV. Um, there's some translations out there that aren't worth, you know, using as a doorstop, honestly. Um, there's, you know, I'm just sorry if you got this one, but like, you know, um, well, <laughs> you know, the message, you know, the message translation is absolute garbage. Um, I don't, it just literally, I just don't even know where the guy came up with some of the stuff he's got in there. But anyway, you know, you got these different translations. King James is just another translation. Okay. If you really want to know what the meanings or what the words mean and what the meaning of the scripture is, you got to go back and either in the New Testament, look at it in Greek or in the Old Testament, look at it in Hebrew. You're just going to have to be a student. You're going to have to look at these things. So I did some digging, and Weist actually has a little note on here. I want to read it to you. He says, The word scarcely is translated of the Greek, and it's a word that means with difficulty. He says, The word is used in Acts 14, 18, where Paul experienced difficulty in restraining the people at Lystra from sacrificing to him as a god. They thought Paul was the God, and they wanted to sacrifice. So that same word, it was difficult to get them to stop worshiping me. Like, I'm not God. Worship Him, right? That's the same word. It was difficult, right? He goes on. He says, the context in 1 Peter 
speaks of the persecutions which were allowed to come by God as a disciplinary judgment, the purpose of which was to purify their lives. Let me ask, let me stop there. I'm gonna, I'll come back, I'll finish this. Watch this though. Watch what he says. The fact that God sent disciplinary judgment. Let me back up and read what he said there. He said that, he says the, the context of 1 Peter speaks of persecutions which were allowed to come by God as disciplinary judgment. Notice he never said, you know, this, now this is Weiss talking, but he's defining the word here. He's not talking about sickness and disease. He's saying persecutions. One of the things that Paul, Paul suffered many things for the, for the sake of the gospel, but one of them was never sickness and disease. He suffered persecutions, he suffered revilings, he suffered all kinds of things. I mean, he was stoned a few times and left for dead in Lystra. Actually, he was stoned and left for dead. He was whipped and beaten several times. I mean, he suffered a lot of things, a lot of persecutions, right? And so he's talking about this idea that, you know, this, this, these persecutions were necessary for purification. Now, what is one of the things that the church seems like they're crying out for? They're crying out for fire. You better be careful what you cry out for. We want the fire of God to fall. We want the fire of God to fall. Anytime I look in my Bible and I see the fire of God mentioned, it has to do with purification. Fire is not fun. You don't want to walk through the fire. Now, is it necessary to walk through fire? Sure. Fire purifies. Fire gets rid of the things. Actually, when it talks about the Holy Spirit, baptism, and fire, it's actually talking about a purifying fire that would burn away the chaff from the wheat. But yet the church is crying out for fire. We shouldn't be, I mean, you need fire. I mean, trust me, there are some churches that need some fire, right? They need some purification. But I'm telling you, you know, be careful what you ask God to put you through because, yes, He wants you pure. But if you want to be tried by fire, He will, he will honor your request. He will try you by fire. Now, it won't be sickness and disease, it'll be persecutions, it'll be things people come against you. He'll try you, He'll see whether you're pure or not. And He'll actually purify, He'll use people to purify you. God, why are all these people around me? Because I'm teaching you to love them. Ooh. You know, the whole thing, you know, that, well, that, and, you know, be, you know don't ever pray for patience. Well, you know, patience. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he will try you on patience. Are you patient? God's like, I, I, God, it's almost like a holdout. Are you as patient as I am? God's like saying, are you as patient as me? We'll find out if you're patient. But yet patience, watch this, patience is a, is, is a fruit of the Spirit. Now watch, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Well, we call them the fruits of the Spirit, but notice it's not the fruits of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's fruit, not one. You can't pick and choose which one you want to bear. If you're going to bear fruit of the Spirit, you've got to bear each and every one of those. Right? Now, he goes on. So he's talking about, you know, God was sending these things that were necessary. These persecutions were necessary, but it was to purify them, right? And so he says... Um, he says they were being used, yeah, sorry, they were being saved with difficulty in the sense that it was a necessity for God to purify the lives of the saints by these drastic means, namely persecution and suffering. What can one say as to the position of the unsaved in relation to God? If the righteous need disciplinary judgments, how much more will the unrighteous merit the wrath of God, wrath of God whose, who offer, or sorry, whose offer of righteousness they have rejected? So in other words, because if you back up there, if you actually go back to verse 17, he actually talks about judgment starts at the house of God. <coughs> Didn't he say that? Judgment, that's where judgment starts, right? So he's saying if, if judgment starts at the house of God, and, the, and the, watch, the righteous are difficultly saved, or it's, you know, it's, it's difficult in the sense of, yes, it's difficult because it's persecutions. It's you know, the idea of saved meaning purification. It's difficult to walk through these things. If the righteous have to suffer these things, how much more will the unrighteous suffer the wrath of God in that day of judgment? So that's what he's saying in context. Again, you just got to kind of take your time and look at these things and understand, you know, yeah, that could be absolutely twisted. And someone could say, well, how do you know you're saved? Because the Bible says the righteous are scarcely saved, so you might not even be saved. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about those that, you know, the righteous are difficultly saved or difficultly purified by the trying of fire, by the trying of persecutions and, and all those things that they suffer. So, um, now, let's see what else we got. We got one more. <clears throat> when we, actually, no, we got two more, sorry. When we lay hands on the sick and they are healed with, with proof, um, is your healing permanent 
or yeah, is, yeah, is your healing permanent? I've ne- I never hear of the Bible speaking of losing their healing, uh, but Pastor Curry Blake said, you can. Uh, do we lose it, or, do, or does symptoms return? Uh, just fake symptoms from the devil? Do we just cast it down? Okay, so a couple things here. Yeah, the Bible really never shows us a place where somebody lost their healing. I think, again, the Bible gives us enough information to show us, well, it shows us the truth, but it also shows us you know, how to do it. The Bible doesn't show you everything. The Bible shows you enough, okay? Um, John actually says at the end of his uh, gospel, he says, I suppose that if, uh, if, um, if, there were, you know, if, if everything that Jesus did was recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. So obviously we know we ain't got everything, okay? Now, can people lose their healing? I mean, yes, they can. We talked about this yesterday. I don't think I need to really hammer into that again. They can lose their healing. If you do something that got you into that situation and you go back and do it again, Okay, just the idea of sowing and reaping. I said, I said, we don't think we need to go re- rehash this again. So yes, people can lose their healing. Um, is, it, does it, is it that the symptoms return? Yes, sometimes, okay, let me, let me explain it this way. Sometimes, okay, if we do a healing service, right, and we lay hands on you, we set you free, right, and I'm not saying, please understand, what, you know, well, I'm not saying every sickness and disease is a devil. Not every sickness and disease means you have a devil. Now, if I see sickness and disease, it means that the devil was there and left his mark. Now, it could be that there is a devil attached to you and that we're going to get rid of that thing and it has to leave. And let's just say, for instance, you've got pain riddled through your body. And it, if, it's pain, if it's pain with an undiagnosed, like undiagnosed pain, uh, and it's been going on for years, chances are, and there's pretty good chances, it's a spirit of infirmity. Spirit of infirmity is not hard to deal with. Uh, it's actually very easy to get rid of a spirit of infirmity. You just tell that thing to go, and it pretty much goes. The thing with the spirit of infirmity is the spirit of infirmity opens the door for other things to come in. Okay, And Jesus talked about the different spirits. I mean, we could sit and name spirits, spirit of fear, spirit of infirmity, um, you know, all these different things. You could name, you know, whatever you want to name, um, spirit of depression, spirit of suicide. Uh, you could name these things, and they are demons, demons that manifest those uh, characteristics through their host. Uh, a spirit of fear is actually a demon that's afraid. Uh, that demon will manifest that fear through you because it needs to have you to manifest it, so it likes to manifest it through you. And so all of a sudden now you're afraid. You, why am I afraid? I'm afraid for no reason. Well, that's usually a spirit of fear, and you've got to recognize those things, right? And so, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to realize, you know, what, you've got to find out, okay, what am I dealing with, okay? So now let's just say it's pain. Let's say we've got, we got a, you know, Person A is up here. They're just riddled with pain. You know, I, I discern, okay, that's definitely a spirit of infirmity. Go right now in the name of Jesus. And that thing leaves. I release life into her. Boom, it's done, right? She walks out the building. Healing service over. She walks out the build, building. Maybe she gets in her car. Maybe she drives home, gets out of the car. And all of a sudden, little twinges of pain start to happen again, right? What does that mean? Does that mean that she lost her healing? Does that mean, so what, what, what does that mean then? Does it mean that maybe this was just emotionalism and that really wasn't what happened? No, no, no. What that means is that spirit did leave, right? But as soon as she got out from under where we were, it tried to say, okay, let me see if I can go back and reattach myself. Will she resist me this time? See, that's the thing we have to realize. That, I said this yesterday, deliverance without discipleship will always lead to more deliverance. Right? Because if she, does it, if she does not resist the enemy, because I said this this morning, resist the enemy and he shall what? Flee. Flee. You know that word resist in the Greek is the Greek word um, antihistamine. It's, it, I probably, I might be pronouncing it wrong, but it's antihistamine, and it's where we get our English word antihistamine. What does antihistamine do? It, it resists histamine. It's what makes you sneeze and snot and carry on, right? It resists that. It shuts it off. That's the word it uses for resisting the devil. Antihistamine him, resist him, and he shall flee. So when the enemy tries to come back and reattach itself, and you, know, you start feeling those twinges of pain come back on, you go, no, in the name of Jesus, I'm bought with the precious blood of Jesus. You will not re-inhabit this place. Get out of here. And you resist him. Now, let me tell you something. You, you treat the devil like that every time he comes knocking on the door, he ain't going to knock on the door anymore. 
But Christians haven't been taught how to resist the enemy that when you feel these things, whether it's pain, whether it's anxiety, whether it's fear, whether it's depression, that you speak to that thing as it's an entity because it is, and you tell it what you want it to do. One of our declarations in acknowledging what is you is, is this, I'm God's son, I'm man's servant, and I'm the devil's master. Now, most Christians don't believe they're the devil's master, but you're the devil's master. You don't take orders from him, he takes orders from you. You tell him what you want him to do. And see, now, I didn't plan on going here, but we're going to go here. The devils, demons, devils, whatever you want to call them, you know, there is the devil and then there's his demons, they can smell fear. Just like dogs can smell fear, you know, dogs actually can, there's actually a pheromone. They can, they can sense fear. Dogs are very smart. They can sense, they can smell it. They know when a person's in fear. Demons are the same way. They will know whether you know who you are or not. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? They did, sons of, seven sons of Sceva didn't know who they were. They were trying to use the name with no relation to the name. They didn't know who they were. They saw, they saw Paul and them doing it and said, well, let's, let's give this a shot. Let's give this a whirl, right? And so they said, you know what? Let's give it a whirl. And so they tried, to, they, tried to cast, they tried to cast a demon out of this person, right? Now, the demon came out, but it whipped their tail and sent them running, right? And what, but watch, before the demon whipped their tail and sent them scattering, what did he say? Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who are you? What does that mean? Paul and Jesus, and, and watch, and you, should be building a reputation in hell. We know Jesus. We know Paul. But who are you? We don't have to listen to you. You don't, you don't walk in authority. You, you don't, you, you, we can smell the fear on you. You're just trying to use this name. And he sends them running. Now watch. One man, Jesus, who knows who he is, can cast seven demons out of a woman. But seven guys who don't know who they are can't even get rid of one. You've got to know who you are. You've got to know you're a new creation. You've got to know, I am a son of God. I'm, I'm, watch, I'm a son of God. I'm man's servant. I'm the devil's master. You may have to say that a couple of times until you start believing. I'm, I'm a son of God. I'm man's servant. I'm the devil's master. And maybe even, if they, well, I don't want to talk to the enemy. Well, then you ain't going to be very good at deliverance. You tell him what you want him to do. You listen to me, devil. You will listen to me. You will take orders from me. I don't listen to you. So we got to understand this stuff, right? And so now, this is why discipleship is important, because you've got to teach people how to resist this stuff when it tries to come back, and it will try to come back. Now, could it be, the, 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 I think it's a kind of a several-part question here. It says, you know, is it the symptoms are returning? Yes, could be. Is it fake symptoms? Yes, could be. Healing is, uh, <clears throat> healing is interesting. Uh, wow, 10 minutes already. we got to move. Watch this. I mean, time flies when you're having fun. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> fake symptoms. Yes, there are fake symptoms. I say fake symptoms. Please understand what I'm... There are, there are, there's pain, and then there's spirits of pain. Right? Just like, you know, a, a spirit of infirmity. You know, you go to the doctor, and you, you tell them, I got all this stuff going on with me, and they seem like they can never pinpoint it. What's going on? That's spiritual. That is definitely 100% spiritual. If they, well, we ran all these tests, we ran blood works, we did an MRI, we did a CAT scan. We just don't know what's wrong with you. That's spiritual. Guarantee you, 100% it's spiritual. Right? And so there are spirits of pain, right? Where those, 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 that now a spirit of pain is a demon who feels pain constantly. And so what's he do? He attaches to you, and then what do you feel constantly? So you address these things and you tell them to go. Now, you don't have to call them out name by name. Okay, I've got to figure out what spirit this is. And I mean, okay, well, this is, is this a spirit of pain? Is this a spirit? You know? No, no, you just tell that spirit what you want it to do. If you want it to leave that person, you don't have to call it out by name. You could if you wanted to, but you just tell that devil, go. You leave. Now, there's a difference between speaking from your mouth. Well, yeah, speaking from your mouth, from your throat, or from your belly. Now the Bible says in John chapter 8 that out of your bellies shall flow what? Rivers of living water. So we don't speak from our mouth. We don't even speak from our throat or our lungs. We speak from our belly. And there's a difference. I promise you there's a difference. Now, in the beginning, as you're developing this, you have to get aggressive. Now, aggressive doesn't always mean loud. Okay? 
my dad could be aggressive with me with his eyes. How many ever had that look? Dad or mom looked at you and you go, oh boy, I'm in trouble. You know, it's, like, it's like, I know I'm getting it when I get home. I saw the look, right? Demons recognize that look. They know if you mean business or not. So it doesn't mean that you always have to be loud. Because honestly, you can't go into hospitals and be loud because you'll have security call, you know, called and you'll be getting out of there pretty quick. So sometimes you've got to be aggressive, but aggressive quietly. Like you're leaving right now. You hear me? Get out. Right? But it, as you develop this, sometimes you may need to get loud before you develop, as you develop that aggressiveness. So in the beginning, you may want to use some more loudness. In other words, this, if you have a child or you know, somebody who's acting up, you, know, you tell the child the first time, hey, don't touch this, and then they touch it again. Okay, I said don't touch that. Right? And then they continue to touch it. Listen, I said don't touch that. And then they do it again. Hey, I said don't touch that. What am I doing? I'm getting aggressive with them. Okay, it's the same in the spirit. You get aggressive with these demons. You get aggressive with these devils and you tell them what you want them to do. So as you build this aggressiveness in you, you may want to be loud in the beginning because let's be honest, if somebody breaks into your house at night, are you going to say, um, hey, please, can you leave? Oh, uh, yeah, we're, we, we would like you to leave before we shoot you. We would like you to leave. No, I don't think anybody's going to address somebody breaking into their house like that, are they? You're going to be like, get out of here right now. That's how you're going to talk to them, right? That's how we talk to devils. Now watch. There's a difference. Because I could tell you, go. I could tell you from the lungs, go. Or I could tell you from my spirit, go. You hear the difference? It's the third time I brought it out of here. Now it got a little louder, but that third time I actually, I actually... I, I actually physically brought it from here. I, didn't, I, I know it's coming out of my mouth, but I actually forced it to come from here out. Because out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. So if I need to tell something to go, I ain't going to tell it to go pretty nice. I'm going to tell it from here. It's time for you to leave. Now, as I develop that, I can develop that aggressiveness, and I can still bring that same thing out of my belly, out of my spirit, quietly. You can even do it with a look. You can look at a devil and say, I love this. And how do I know this is true? Because I think there's a, there's a passage, I think, in Luke where they're bringing all the sick to Jesus, the lame, all this stuff. And it says, and the demon possessed. And it says he didn't permit the devils to speak. Now watch it. It didn't say he, he, didn't say he gave him instructions. Okay, devils, you will not speak now. It just says he didn't allow. What does that mean? There must have been a look and an intimidation from Jesus that the devils weren't even allowed to act up. Now, when a devil did act up with Jesus, one time in his own home synagogue, a devil, the devil acted up and somebody began to manifest, he actually told them to shut up. What did he say? He says, hold thy peace. Now, if you go read that in the East, it meant shut up, get quiet, and stay that way. That's exactly what he told a devil when a devil acted up. So what do you do? When devils act up, you shut it down. I don't need you, okay, it, you know, because I've seen deliverance ministries out there. There's some deliverance ministries out there. They like to get the people all worked up. They get them throwing up. They get them renouncing. They, it becomes a big show, and for 30 minutes, this person has got throw up all over the floor. They're snotting out their nose. They're wailing around on the ground, and it's like, would you just get it over with already? I mean, Dr. Lester Summerall used to say, if you think deliverance is going to take, take all day, pack a bag lunch. But if you go in there knowing you're a son, and the first go, they have to go, then it's going to be easy. I don't need you to act up. I, matter of fact, if, you, if a devil begins to manifest in front of me, I will probably shut it down. I, I would just absolutely, no, right now, you don't need to do that. I'm telling you, go right now in the name of Jesus, get out. And then I just release life over that person. I don't need to make it a big show. I don't need to make it a big deal. I don't need to find out where did you come from? How did you get here? How did, you know? And you see all this stuff on TV. You know? And it's like, and it, I mean, honestly, it's, it's almost humiliating to the person because then the person's all over YouTube and they're snot flying out their nose and whoa. And they're telling them how you know, and they make them renounce all these things. Okay, well, first of all, where do you see in scripture that Jesus made people renounce things before they were free? He just set them free. He didn't say, Well, where did you get this devil? Were you watching this program when you got it? Were you watching? He didn't get any of that. He said, Be free right now, go, go in Jesus' name. And he set them free. The church has gotten it backwards. We think we, think we can disciple people to freedom. We don't, we don't disciple people to freedom, you don't counsel devils out. You don't counsel devils out. You cast them out. Right? The backwards church says, hey, come be a part of my meetings and I'll disciple you to freedom. I'll get you, I'll get you free eventually. Jesus says, here, I'll set you free. 
and then I'll disciple you. We've got it so backwards. We want to, we want to, you know, and again, I'm, again, I understand demons manifest and, and they will manifest. They'll manifest in meetings. Most men of God, when you see them manifest in meetings, especially some of Dr. Old Lester, old, old Dr. Lester Summerall videos, you watch some of those things, if demons began to manifest in those meetings, he shut it down. He, he just shut it down. And he, he talked about it. He's, actually, he's got, he was probably the, I say the epitome, but honestly, just the, just probably one of the most, most knowledgeable people on demonology. Uh, he actually did a whole. He actually did a whole demonology seminar, like a course. Curry's actually got it now because he learned pretty much everything from him. But he's actually got. Um, there's actually a great little book by Lester Summerall. We don't have it, but if you can get it on Amazon, it's it's actually called Demons: The Answer Book, and it's great. It's a great little book, and he actually talks. He talks about a lot of the experiences that he had with demonic stuff and how he didn't allow them to act up. He had one time. He had somebody. Well, this was early on when he was first getting started in the ministry. He had somebody slither down the middle aisle. And, you know, he was like, Lord, Lord, what are they doing, you know? And he, he, he told him, he, knocked, he knocked it right out of him, and the person sat right back up, got in her chair, and it was done. He had one time, no joke, he had one time, he was, I was preaching somewhere, I don't know where he was preaching, he said he was preaching somewhere, he says, and this gentleman sat on the front row, he says, and constantly, amen, 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 amen. He says, and for me, I'm like, I'm trying to remember, he's like, it was getting distracting. He says, so I was like, well, I know this is definitely the devil. He says, because this thing is just like, amen, 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 amen. And finally he said, would you shut up? And the guy was like, and he didn't talk the rest of the service. But he says, I know it was demonic. Well, Paul encountered that. Remember, remember the little girl that would follow them around and say, these are the men of God that will show you the way. These are the men of God that will show you the way. These are the men of God that will show you the way. Finally, Paul's like, shut up! And cast that thing out of her. And right then they got in trouble and were thrown in prison because... Some people lost their business. But there was quiet, yes. <laughs> There's quiet in prison, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, but looking at these things now, I know we didn't get to get into some of the practical. We did, well, we did get into some of the practical, but when we come back, I'm going to show you something else practical uh, that we need to be you know, using as a son of God and, and activating. I say activating. I don't like using the word activating. I like just receiving and stepping into and walking in.